Welcome to our workshop tonight. It's so nice to see you all here. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to spend your summer. The title of the workshop tonight is Summer's Here. Are you college app ready? Anyone ready? <laughs> um, just let me take a poll. How, how many of you are parents of rising seniors? All right, it's showtime. Um, <laughs> how, how about um, parents of rising juniors? Awesome. And rising sophomores? And rising freshmen? You're a rising sophomore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how about middle schoolers? <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so glad you got here tonight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage your time in the summer. Um, and so your child will be college app ready in the fall. All right. There's three things I'm going to try to cover tonight. One is refining your college list. And by the way, you can see there's there's some notebooks on your chairs. Please feel free to use that for notes. Um, in the back, you'll see my, my business card. So after tonight, if you need to email me, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, we'll also give you an opportunity after tonight to sign up for a free initial consultation if you haven't had one. So please, you can write your name down with Kim and she'll take your um, information for the free consultation if you'd like to do that. Um, so the, the first thing I wanna cover is uh, refining your college list. The second thing I'm gonna cover is um, spend really thinking carefully about how much you need to uh, how much time you need to spend on writing the college essays okay and then the third thing I'm going to talk about is um, early admissions strategies something that uh, I think everyone should know a little bit about before they head into the summer so they can start to work backwards and plan I'm a big planner um, <laughs> I love spreadsheets it's just my nature um, and so this kind of comes out of that this workshop so let's go ahead and start. Um, so where do you begin? Um, I think many students over the years that I've been working um, you know, on this side of the table, as they say, with, with high school students and families, um, I think many students get overwhelmed by the media and what's out there. More than not, I hear students say, well, my friend got into this school or they didn't get into this school. And you know, everything is kind of um, hearsay and not really necessarily relevant to yourself or to your child, right? So we have a lot of information. Right now, our you, you know, Generation Z, there's so much information that they have access to on their phones, right? And th there's multiple articles a day, right, on college admissions. I don't know if you ever, if any of you read that article a couple years ago, um, Stanford, <laughs> they, it was like a joke, Frank Bruni, who writes, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he said that, uh, you know, in, in his article, <laughs> It was like a total um, like satire of the, of the whole process. And he said 0% of students, of applicants were admitted to Stanford this year. And there was like about 20% of the students or people that read it actually believed it. <laughs> but it was a joke. And you know, I mean, it's, it just shows you how much tension there is and how much mis misinformation there is. Um, so really, what's relevant to you? What's relevant to your child? Um, it can be hard to know how to start planning for college, right? Because it is a very complex process. Um, so you, I know you came tonight because you care about your children, you care about their futures. Um, this is a big transition, going from high school to college, right? And I have children myself, I have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and I can feel the years sort of slipping by very quickly. And every time I visit colleges, I think about, oh, this would be a great school for this child, and, um, but it's gonna be upon me fast. And so I really recognize as a parent how stressful it is and how complex it is. Um, but you want your child to have college options. I'm assuming you're all here because you want them to not only get into college, but you want them to thrive. You want them to be happy, right? And you want this to be a foundation for the rest of their life. And you know that when they go to college that they will be making relationships with their peers, with their faculty, that can really be a foundation for career um, and, and, the, and the future. So summer is a perfect time to dig in and start to make progress on the college admissions process. Um, my name is Jenny Umhofer, for those of you who have never met me before. Um, I'm the owner and founder of College, college admissions consulting company here. And before, and we've been around for about eight years. Um, before I founded the company, I worked in college admissions for over 10 years. And um, the first place I worked was UCLA as an admissions officer. I recruited the nation's top artists, 
both visual performing and film. Um, and I also read for the general applica uh, application pool. Um, and at that point, we had maybe 40, 50,000 applications. Does anyone know how many applications they had this year? 106. Oh, wow. Pretty good, pretty close. But 106,000 applications for, can anyone guess how many spots? 6,000. 20? Did you say 20 spots? <laughs> uh, yeah, 6,000 spots actually for t to target that, that as an enrollment goal, right? So imagine going from 106 to 6. It's a pretty big sweeping gap. Um, so I've read about 1,000 applications uh, a year, and that took me a good six weeks. It was a lot, right? And I was reading two essays. I would read the um, extracurricular activities. We didn't have any letters of rec. We still don't have letters of rec for UCLA, but they do for Berkeley. Um, and it took me about five minutes. I would skim the application, right? And if it didn't stand out to me, next, right? And there were paper applications at that point. Um, five minutes, that's all I had. Then I worked at Caltech in admissions, and obviously, you know, we all, I, you all live in Pasadena area? Yeah. So we all know Caltech. Um, it was a very self-selecting pool of applicants, and I would spend about 15 minutes on an application. I read about 500. So it was less applications total, but the read was much deeper because we had letters of recommendation. Um, we had, um, in our read, we had multiple reads where we had faculty as part of the decision-making process. Um, just like in, in the UK, there's, it's more faculty-driven admissions because um, the faculty wanted to be sure that they could handle the problem sets and <laughs> Caltech student um, rigor. And then I worked at Scripps College, um, the Women's College in the Claremont Consortium, and it's probably one of my favorite places to work um, just because I, I really love the students and I loved the quality of education that the students received. Um, and at that, admissions office, I think I took more like 25 minutes to 30 minutes on an application. So really, you know, thorough. And in fact, even when we would go to committee and discuss why a student should be admitted or not, if there was any question, I might go back and do deeper research by calling the counselor, by calling the teacher, by calling the family. Um, and so it could take maybe like an hour I could spend on one applicant, right? And I would do interviews. So that was taken into consideration as well. Um, so I felt like between the three, you know, the, the private schools did a much better job of making sure that this was the right fit for, you know, the evaluation, within the evaluation. So anyway, I'm giving you that background just to give you a sense of context and where I come from. Um, after I worked in admissions, then I had my own children, and so, you know, that's when I kind of fell into this and have never looked back. Um, I, but really, I'm not the most important person here. You are, and your child. Um, I'm sure that you want to learn more about how to make the most of your summer, and so you're the people that I want to help tonight. <laughs> so, if I before I dive into sort of the list and what to what to, how to refine your college list, there's a couple of things I I want to go over. Year after year after year after after year, I see that there are sort of common mistakes or patterns that students and parents make. Um, when they start this process. The first one is that I feel very strongly about is that there's too much focus on test prep. Um, there's a lot of money and a lot of energy and a lot of time spent on getting these scores that you know could be the, the, the deal breaker. Okay, so I'm gonna go over sort of how test prep or test, test requirements are evaluated in admissions. Um, but I find that that's one of the ways that parents and students kind of hold on to this process. Oh, if I can control that, <laughs> then everything will every, everything else will work out, and that's not the case. 800s are denied, and um, you know, 800s you know in the um, SAT critical reading or math are denied um, as much as 750s or 790s, right? So um, that's just my personal feeling is that because we look at the admissions process as holistic, test prep is only one part of it. So the other thing is that I notice a lot of kids, they get wrapped up in their score and it becomes very defining, right? I'm not smart if I don't get a certain score or I can never achieve, right? And I think there's just too much focus. 
Um, the other mistake I think families make is number two, failure to manage time. So that's kind of why I developed this workshop because I feel, I feel like um, there's a real lack of understanding of actually what needs to happen to be successful in college admissions. Um, and believe it or not, you can control a lot of it if you understand how to manage your time well. Um, so, and especially in the summer where there's a lot of distractions and it's just free time, you know, <laughs> you wanna take a break, right? You wanna you want relax. So it's not about not relaxing as it is about managing your time and understanding what you need to do each day or each week to make progress towards your success. Okay, so, and then the third thing is trying too hard to impress colleges with too many activities. Um, you know, we used to, in college admissions, look at an applicant and really value um, them if they were well balanced. They had a lot of involvement, right? And leadership was the buzzword. This was like 15, 20 years ago. Um, now, admissions offices are really valuing um, angular qualities. So something that helps the students stand out. You don't have to be involved in everything, but what you are involved in should be meaningful. It should be something you really are getting something out of, right? Not just for college admissions. So I feel like that is also something uh, that, that people get caught up in, and it's wasted energy. Um, okay, so let me just kind of give you an overview of how admissions decisions are made. And this is a very broad graph that kind of gives you something to hold on to. Obviously, you know, when I was at Caltech, test scores are big, right? Um, transcript is huge. When I was at Scripps College, essays are even bigger. Demonstrated interest is bigger. So, but this is just kind of a general pie chart so you get a sense of, of um, what to do here. 45% of the admissions decision is based on the transcript alone. So how are you doing in the classroom? That's your job as a student, right? If you're doing as, as much as you can to get the grades that will reflect, reflect your true intellect, then that is, that's really the most important priority you can focus on as a student. Um, the second thing is test scores. So 20%, I would say, is a pretty healthy percentage that most colleges will be looking at because it's, um, it's all uniform, right? It can be compared across the country or even internationally. Transcript is tricky. Colleges, highly selective colleges, really also look closer than just how did you perform, what classes did you take, um, because they know, highly selective colleges know that some high schools, they do great inflation, everyone gets A's, and so they have to look really carefully at how many valedictorians really are there and how many students are you ranking number one. So that's why all these other pieces matter. Um, so, and a lot of students don't realize that 20% of the, the admissions decision is based on essays. What you choose to write about and how you decide to present yourself is so compelling. And in fact, sometimes when your test scores are kind of on the bubble, an essay can really push you over. Um, many colleges now have multiple essays because they're really trying to get at the root of, do you really want us? Who do you, who are you? You know, can you tell us? So that piece, it requires reflection, it requires thought, it requires time, right? And it's your opportunity, it's your window, and it's something you can control. Um, involvement in activities, about 8%, I would say. So again, the meaningful activities really do carry the day. Um, letters of recommendation. So right now, I can tell you a couple of colleges like Vanderbilt and University of Pennsylvania, um, they're doing something, they're rating, the content of the letters of recommendation. So um, when you ask your teachers for letters of rec, if they talk about, you know, the, the, if they have a theme, if they really talk, reflect back at, you know, something that you're doing in the classroom that really is outstanding, and they back it up with an example, you're probably gonna be rated higher than when they're just, oh, a good kid shows up to class, <laughs> you know, participates in class, that's kind of a general thing, right? So the content of the letters of recommendation, what they're saying, we don't see the letters of rec, you don't see the letters of rec, but you're performing in the classroom, right? So at, like UPenn, those letters of rec, if they're not rate, rank, rate, rated at 10, they're rarely admitted. Okay, so I'm just using those as an example, right? Not all, yeah, you have a question. Oh, I have a question about letters of recommendation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, does it matter, like, do the letters of recommendation need to come from the core classes? 
you know, it depends on the college. Mm -hmm. um, at Caltech, we required a um, letter of rec from a math science teacher and a humanities teacher, so both. But usually, yeah, there are more um, core classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so academic classes. But you can also have, a lot of colleges will allow optional letters of rec, and you can have a coach yeah. or somebody else who knows you, knows the student, um, write a letter of recommendation on their behalf. Um, so that's just a piece of information about letters of rec. And then demonstrated interest. Okay, so colleges, um, especially the private colleges, they want students who want them, right? They're, they're, they're aware of how many colleges you're gonna be applying to, and they know that you, know, you might have more choices. So the demonstrated interest piece is really actually important because if you haven't demonstrated any interest either through the essay that you write or done an interview with them or opened your email, they're tracking that, <laughs> newsflash. Um, if you haven't attended an event that they're hosting in Los Angeles um, and you've never been to their campus, if you don't demonstrate any interest at all, even if you have all this other stuff, they might think you're not gonna come if they admit you. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so, but if a, if a school is across the country, there's, and you don't visit, I mean, do they take into account? A lot of distance? colleges, if they offer interviews, the reason why they're offering interviews is because of that. Yeah, okay. And so, um, if you can't make it, a yeah. lot of times they will do a Skype interview or they'll do alumni interview. Oh, okay. um, they have events here. Uh, they have, if you can get on their email mailing list and you've got to open those emails. Unfortunately, our kids, you know, teens, high school students, they don't use email. Um, and so that's an indication that, especially if they're not opening an email, that they may not really want to go to that college. Um, so one of the things that we developed actually before this happened, um, we developed, so some of the colleges more recently, just in the past few years, are starting to read in teens. So when I did admissions, I was like a single reader, alone, you know, 12 midnight, you know, just exhausted, and making my, my notes and making recommendations. Then it would go to second reader, third reader, and then we sit around in committee and discuss, you know, who should get in. Um, now, it's taking too long. That kind of reading process is way too labor intensive. Um, 106,000, you know, I, I don't know how any staff could do that. Um, so, Recently, UPenn has developed, and I'm not into UPenn, I don't know, it's just been, you know, they've been a leader in, in admissions lately. Um, they have developed a team reading approach where they have two admissions officers reading together. And that way they can discuss, in, even in their first reads, um, little things they notice and then make a decision together. And it's actually more efficient. So what's been funny about that or ironic about that is I, I had developed a team approach to our services where every student who works with us in an all-inclusive comprehensive plan, junior, senior year, will get a team lead who has college admissions experience and an essay specialist and myself. So there's three of us and we meet regularly to discuss the student. So, um, because as someone who knows how admissions decisions are made, it's really complicated. So to have that committee uh, process on this side, advocating for students on this side of the table is really what, um, what drives my passion. So, Anyway, so that's a little bit about admissions. Okay, so let's, let's talk about summer. Um, how do you maximize your time in the summer? Okay, let's get down to business. So I think the best thing you can do right now, especially if you're a rising senior, is take out a calendar and put down everything that you're doing this summer from the day you end school to the day you start school. Right, you have approximately three months, two and a half. You know, some, some schools, they start earlier and earlier, right? Um, so vacations, put your vacations down, right? Put your summer school down. When are you gonna be going to summer school? Um, then you wanna put your activities, because you're probably like involved in other stuff, right? Like athletics or extracurriculars. Um, you also wanna put down on that calendar, when are you gonna visit the colleges? Even locally, right? They're gonna take tours. And when are you gonna have that time to do that? There's not as many students on campuses in the summers, but it's still your, your free time. So this is, this is how you make the most, right? Um, the other thing is, how, when are you going to write your essays, right? There should be some time in there, so you are writing your essays. Okay, 
So now let's get down to business. Um, how do you refine your college list early? When we work with students, one of the biggest things we stress is we usually start our process in January of junior year. So by now, our students that we're working with, we've already done a lot of back research for them on their behalf, and then they do research in partnership with us, and they refine their list by June. And once they refine their list, they have a roadmap, right? Um, so the two things you need to refine your list, self-knowledge, who are you? And that's hard to know everything, right? When you're in high school, you're still discovering who you are. But what are your strengths? What are your interests? What makes you happy? What makes you a special child? Every child is special. Every child is unique. Every child has something going on and we just need to learn what that is, right? Um, so start with the student, start with yourself, okay? The other piece you need to know is you need to understand the college values. And understanding the college values, um, like that's a kind of like, the question you might wanna ask is, what kind of student does well here? So not what kind of student gets in here, what kind of student does well? And does that match my self-knowledge? Okay? Now this is a lot, this is hard to do. This is where we all get hung up, right? That's why we exist, <laughs> our company exists, because we know that this connection is very hard to get to at a young age. Um, but these are the two pieces that you have to have to make your list. Um, you want to, in the summer, early summer, ideally have a good list, I think 10 colleges, is a good amount of colleges to apply to these days. Okay, um, so you make your college list. Um, when you have kind of refined it down, one of the things, a couple things you want to remember. In your college list, let's say you have 10, right? This is the FIS guide. Does everyone know what the FIS guide is? If you don't know what it is, it's a great book that's written by Edward B. Fisk every year, and he reviews about seven or 800 American colleges. Um, He's not affiliated with any college. So it's a great guide to look at if you're looking at a specific college. But you want to have maybe one or two likely schools. We don't call them safeties. <laughs> likely, OK? Um, and that means you're, in the, you're above the mid-50 percentiles, right? You're above on the GPA. You're really above on the scale. It's like really likely that you'll probably get in. And those likely schools should be Exciting. It should not be like, oh, I guess I'll apply, you know, maybe I'll put it on my list because I have to have a likely school. No, you might not have any other options, right? So that likely school that you have on your, hi, <laughs> no problem. Um, you want that school to be, or those two schools to be exciting, that you really understand if you go to school there, that you'd be happy, okay? So maybe you want to have about three to five possible schools and then you wanna have about one to three, it depends on the student, reach schools, okay? And within those one to three, maybe one long shot. All the IVs for all students are long shots, right? So students who apply to all the IVs are gonna look at a lot of rejection, typically. So be wary. So that's, that's the balance that you wanna go for. Um, we do our own research, like I said earlier, for our students on best fit colleges. Um, we're gonna start with, you know, tailor making the list according to the student's strengths and interests and then, of course, potential outcome. That's the benefit, is that we're gonna be able to help you with that. Okay, so I wanna talk to a little bit about how we worked with Cole. He was one of our students. Um, and Cole went to a big public school. He had a GPA of 4.36 weighted, ACT composite of 33 out of 36. Um, an SAT subject test in chem, 750, US history, 720. Pretty darn good scores all around, great numbers. Um, he had senior year courses of AP environmental science, AP statistics, AP art history, AP English, and tennis. And then very involved in a lot of activities. Um, he was really a great kid, very kind of quirky, brainy, um, all around really liked, well liked by his peers. Um, and we, we loved him. But um, one of the things that he struggled with was um, 
he he had parents who were both architects and had gone through architecture school and had their own businesses and hadn't done well. So he really struggled because on the one hand he was passionate about architecture and been raised by these great parents, um, but his parents also wanted him to have some stability going forward. So he was considering engineering and he was such a great student all around that he, um, that he certainly had the math and the science um, strengths to be able to succeed in engineering. So he really struggled when he first came to us in the spring of his junior year um, in terms of what direction he should take it, right? So how we worked with him was, the first thing we did was we gave him a personality assessment. Um, and that, even though they're young and they may be, I'm not sure if that's me, they might respond that way, it's still a great way to identify a whole range of things that the student could be, you know, um, going into. So, uh, you know, personality assessment was really for career and major options. And what we discovered in that personality assessment was he had um, not only strengths in science and in art, <laughs> but he also had this strength in, in the health-related fields. Um, so it just was a great top um, starting point for the discussion. Um, so we really encouraged his strengths, and we didn't force him to choose because it's hard to choose in high school, and especially those two very different areas. Um, and we refined his college list by basically presenting a wide range of colleges that would offer him multiple areas where he could be, you know, explore, continue to explore. We worked really hard with him on his essay work, um, and for his, just to give you an example, his four UCs, his essays that he wrote, um, he wrote one on cello and failure, and like he, he went to a audition for the youth symphony, and he played the wrong piece <laughs> and walked out and realized, oh my gosh, and then he didn't get in. So it was just a very humorous, kind of interesting piece about his cello um, and his passion for cello. Um, he wrote about his love of chemistry and the teacher that inspired him. You know, that was one of the, the formative moments in his high school education. Um, he wrote about starting a cycling club, which really sort of showcased his leadership and his interest in helping, you know, community. And then he wrote a great essay on how arts and math intersect which was exactly who he is, right? Um, so, and then he worked on other supplemental essays for the private schools. Um, we also worked with him on interview prep. Um, Armand, our, one of our team leads, helped him with some interview prep for USC and Villanova. He ended up winning a scholarship for Villanova and was pretty much admitted to almost every school on his list. Um, and we also helped him with merit aid and scholarship guidance because his parents were concerned about that in the end. Um, and that is more and more what people are facing because college is expensive. And especially in a, in a case like, like Cole's, he had the number, he had all of these sort of academic accolades and we really could see colleges that could potentially offer him some scholarship money to help offset that. So he was accepted to UC Berkeley, he's going to be attending Berkeley in the fall of 2020. Okay, so let's move on to no topic number two, which is using summer to write your way into college. I feel like after going through this again and again with students, it really is that profound that you can, once you make a decision to write essays and write well and listen to feedback, um, you write your way into college. Um, we have this wonderful system in the United States, which is a very subjective process. Um, many other countries, it's just grade scores, that's it. If you don't make it in, then you're going to an apprentice program or you're going to whatever. You're not going to college. Um, whereas the US, we have a lot of room for potential, right? Um, so the writing process is part of that potential and it shows the potential. So we start with brainstorming. This is the part where students tend to overlook the pre-writing, mm -hmm. the pre-work that needs to take place with, a, with writing a really compelling college essay, right? Um, we, we do a lot of writing exercises because when students do um, rep rep repetitive writing exercises with us that are um, kind of getting at different angles of their personality, what happens is they start to develop their voice and they discover who they are while they're writing. So that's why I say write your way into summer, uh, write your way into college. <laughs> um, and usually what we do with our students is 
have them do a down draft. Just get it down. When you're on deadline and you're really trying to get that um, finished, just get everything down. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? And then we bring it up. We need updraft. Rewriting. How many drafts do you think you need to write to be finished at the polished stage? Who can who can kind of tell me? For one essay, how many drafts do you think you need to write? Oh. Want to guess? Like two. Two? Mm-hmm. Good guess. Three. Mm-hmm. Three. I typically see four or five drafts, right? Sometimes I see a draft and it's not even answering the prompt. So, you know, I need you to go back. I'll, I'll say to my students, you did a really good job. This is telling a story about something that's not the prompt, and that's great. <laughs> and we can maybe use that somewhere else, but you need to go back and start again, um, and, and that's okay. And if we have the time, right, then they can do that. Um, structure and polish phase, that's at the very end, you know, maybe two weeks before deadline. We're looking at refining, but it's all about content. It's all about what you're trying to say. You know, and most kids rush this. They skip this, this brainstorming, writing exercises, downdraft, might start doing the updraft, and maybe a rewrite. They do two drafts, and they're like, okay, I'm done. And it's really not their best selves, right? No student should ever submit any essay work until, unless somebody has read it. That is a, a hard and fast rule I will stand by. Um, every student should have at least one person helping them. Um, okay. So I have a couple quick, this is Stanford essay prompts, just to give you a sense of time. Stanford asks, and this has been several years now, I'm assuming they're not changing, they might. Um, The first thing they ask is briefly elaborate on one of your extracurricular activities or work experiences. They don't give a word count, so you get to choose what you wanna talk about. Um, I would say probably 350 is about the most you wanna spend on that, 350 words. Then they have a whole smattering of short questions. And this is interesting, because a lot of kids get tripped up on this. Um, Number two is name your favorite books, author, film, and or artist, 50 word limit. Number three is what newspapers, magazines, and or websites do you enjoy? That says a lot about a student, right? 50 words. Number four, what is the most significant challenge that society faces today? There's a lot of them, right? So is the child connected to any of those? And if so, what are they? 50 words or less? Number five, how do you spend your last two summers? And we're talking about summer. So those of you who are younger, <laughs> Stanford's gonna ask you, how did you spend your last few summers? 50 words or less, right? And it shouldn't really just be um, a list. You know, it should be some paraphrases about, you know, how maybe how, how your summer was meaningful. Um, Number six, what were your favorite events, performances, exhibits, competitions, conferences in recent years? 50 words or less. Number seven, what historical moment or event do you wish you could, could have witnessed? 50 words or less. Says a lot about the person too. Um, number eight, what five words best describe you? So again, like I think it's at this point, if you're a kid and you're going through this and you're maybe on number eight, you're starting to see what they're asking, right? And you haven't even gotten to the major essays yet. <laughs> um, so then they have three short essays that are 100 to 250 words. Doesn't have to be long. Again, we're talking about content. Number nine, Stanford students possess an intellectual vitality. Reflect on an idea or experience that has been important to your intellectual development. It's all about intellectual curiosity for Stanford. All right? 250 words or less. I'll cut you off if you go beyond. Number 10, virtually all of Stanford's undergraduates live on campus. Write a note to your future roommate. Something about you that will help your roommate and us know you better. Some kids just sort of write that casually. Some kids don't, you know. Oh, what, what, what do I say, you know? What, what, what should I talk about? You know, what kind of roommate? I don't know, I've never been a roommate, you know. Um, that can be kind of slightly creative, but it still needs to answer the question. Number 11, what matters to you and why? So that's 11 things you gotta write for one school, right? And usually when we work with students who are like, I'm gonna apply to Stanford. I love Stanford. I think Stanford's a great school. 
Um, but sometimes they get to this and they're like, I don't think I can answer this effectively. And that's okay, right? That's part of the process of learning about yourself in college. Um, the other prompts I want to read you is Occidental. You think Occidental is right over here in Eagle Rock, right? Anybody interested in Occidental? Great school. I love Occidental, small liberal arts. Um, their, their prompts, they have six. <laughs> um, first question they ask, and this is not an essay, have you had the opportunity to visit campus? Remember the demonstrated interest piece? Yes or no? It's right here. If you're at South Pass High or if you're at La Cunada High School and you haven't visited campus, not good, right? They, they're recording that. They're recording those interviews. They're recording, are you stepping foot on campus? Um, number one question, why are you applying to Occidental? I remember when I was talking about knowing self and knowing the college. They want to know why. So if you have stepped onto the campus, pay attention. What are you looking at? What are you looking for? Um, what are your intellectual curiosities? They're also interested in your intellect, right? And why do you think Occidental is the right place for you to pursue them? 200 words. Number two, Oxy's central mission places value on a community composed of diverse backgrounds, life experiences, and perspectives. What do you value in a community, and how do you see your perspectives and life experiences contributing to our sense of community? So who are you, what have you done, and how are you contributing, how would you con contribute to our community? Number three, in addition to an intellectually rigorous experience, Oxy's residential community seeks a vibrant and interesting student body. What's your idiosyncrasy, and how does it reflect your distinct character? Quirks, like what are your, what are you into? Um, number four, what's your favorite word? That's not a long essay. Um, number five, what is the fifth song on the soundtrack of your life? I don't know why they asked for the fifth song. <laughs> why don't they ask for the first and the second? But they asked for the fifth song. They're trying to have fun too. And number six, if you had your own food truck or restaurant, what would it be called? I think that prompt was written by a student. I don't know, just saying. Um, on your seats, there was a handout. And so we're, I just wanted to provide you with um, the handout for the UC prompts. So last year, the University of California went from two main prompts to um, four. So there's eight prompts that you can choose from to pick four. And those four essays are really, should, they should be different perspectives on yourself. Right? So that's for you to just take and so if they're available, right now we're working on those with our students. We're getting to work on UC essays because those aren't going to change. Or at least not that we know of right now. Um, That's essay work. Um, we have, at college, we have essay boot camps. So this has just been integrated in the past couple of years with our services because we realized that even the smartest kids, the best writers, don't really make time for writing the personal statements or the essays for college. And they oftentimes find themselves alone in front of a computer staring at a screen for a long time. And they really don't know how to start. Or they might start, but then they're like, is that right? Is that what they want to hear? You know, and they get kind of tripped up. And, writer's block sets in. So we have these great essay boot camps that are half day essay writing intensive intensives. Um, and we have found that that really helps the students with final drafts, finished drafts before the fall. So you can see on your seat also I put a card or we put a card there. These are all the essay boot camps that are happening this year. Um, and we will be doing the same following years every summer. And they're really for rising seniors only and they're only for our clients. <clears throat> we don't take outside people for the essay boot camps um, because it's so individualized. We have our essay specialists there and give immediate feedback on their essays um, because we know that time is of the essence and so they can really finish their drafts. <clears throat> um, this is kind of an example. I wanted to give you an example of a student essay and you tell me if what you like, the first draft or the second draft. Um, this is Rebecca. We worked with her a couple years ago. She had a weighted GPA of 4.43, excellent student. Um, she attended a local private school here in Pasadena area. Um, SAT, critical reading 680, math 620. And activities, very involved in Girl Scouts, swim team, volunteer at Arcadia Hospital, National Student Leadership Conference at U Berkeley, National Honor Society, Ambassador Club, and Speech and Debate. Um, interestingly, 
um, Rebecca has OCD. She is very involved and very high achieving. And she has OCD. And it got to be pretty crippling for her at a certain point in her high school career. Um, and so one of the things we worked with her on in her essays were, uh, was talking about that. Um, so I'm gonna read the first draft and the second draft. She's actually a great writer. Um, so this is describe the world you come from. To be human is to be flawed. Such is the world in which I live, one that thrives in the imperfect. Life is never quite the smooth paved road you anticipate it to be. Often I stumble, I fail regardless the effort I put forth. Yet in my failure, I have found great strength, for I have seen my capacity to move forward a wiser, more confident individual. To misplace an assignment would typically seize me with panic, yet I've learned to accept my mistake, accept the imperfect. To not be consumed with failure, but the success that is my ability to overcome it is the world in which I live, a world I love. It, however, has not always been this way. And she goes on to talk about her, um, her, her disability. Okay, so that's version one. James, our lead essay specialist, helped her with something called show, don't tell. This is a great example of that. Um, so version two. Rummaging through my backpack, every folder, every binder, I realized I have misplaced an assignment the teacher had just asked to collect. While my instinct is to panic, rather, I draw a deep breath, close my eyes, and calm my frantic state. It is in this moment that I decide to accept my mistake, to accept the imperfect. I then use the situation as an opportunity to learn and grow, to not be consumed with failure, but the success that is my ability to overcome it, to embrace life for all that it offers is the world in which I live, a world I love. It, however, has not always been this way. So the first version is fine. Uh, she could have just submitted that, right? But so that kind of gives you a sense of how much better it became I mean, did you feel as you, I know you weren't reading it on the page, but did you feel different when you heard it the second time? Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. you're in her world. You're, you're seeing her, her go through the backpack. The backpack. And, yeah. So those details, those, um, the way she told the story was really to show us and bring us into her world um, in a more profound way. So she was accepted to and is attending UCSD, the class of 2019. We are immensely proud of Rebecca. Um, okay, so we've talked about lists, we've talked about essay work, now I wanna talk a little bit about early admission secrets. Um, Kim, can you hand out these? I have a really valuable handout that Kim is gonna give you. Um, and this handout is something that, um, it's very hard to find, so I, I want to give this to you to empower you with information. Um, so this third way to use your summer for college planning, once the list is complete and the essays are started, is to really develop a strategy for application deadlines. Okay, so does everyone know what early decision is? Okay, so when you look at this sheet, you see how it says um, ED acceptance rate? That's early decision. Except for when it says EA only, like Harvard says EA only, that's early action, okay? But um, the rest of them are early decision. Early decision is what? Who can tell me? What does it mean when you apply early decision? Binding. Binding. It's a legally binding agreement between you and the college. And students, because they're minors, have to have their parents sign, and they have to have their counselor sign at their high school too. Three people have to sign because it's a very important, it's, it's, the colleges are expecting you to come and pay. <laughs> so um, early decision is ED. Next to that you see RD, acceptance rate, that's regular decision. Okay, so that's usually January. Early decision is usually November and regular is in January. Those are two nice different separate deadlines and that's how you can calendar your deadlines, right? Then you see percentage of class filled in ED, right? So that means how many students actually are, um, have spots, percentage-wise, in their incoming class. Okay, and then you see ED to RD, acceptance ratio, and the source, and then there's additional admission plans. So the, some schools, some private schools will also offer ED to 
which is in January. So let's say a, a student could have a strategy where they're applying ED1 to one school, you know, to give them more of an edge. And then if they don't get into that school, they can do ED2 sometimes at another private school. Okay? So I think um, what I want to draw your attention to is, wow, look at Bard College, 75% of students were accepted in early decision. That's a really high percentage. So if you really want to go to Bard, and there's no question in your mind that if you're admitted, you go, apply ED, <laughs> okay? Um, another one that I want to draw your attention to is um, which one has the highest ED to RD acceptance ratio. Okay, you see on this list. Harvard. Harvard. Interesting, huh? This was in 2016, so mind you, this is not 2017. Those numbers are not public yet. Um, but this one was from 16. It was 14%, 14.9%, almost 15% in, in early action, restrictive early action, versus 3.4% in regular. I, I find that fascinating. Um, another one I want you to look at is NYU. So look at NYU's early decision admit rate for 2016. And then look at the regular decision acceptance rate. Which one is higher? Regular. So actually, if you applied early decision, you had less of a chance than if you applied regular to NYU. OK? Um, UPenn is interesting, too, to me. Pretty high early decision. So which school should you apply to early? Okay, that's something that you need to think about very carefully. Early admissions, there are secrets. This, this helps the colleges, right? And it should help you. You have to think about it carefully. Okay, early decision is not for everybody. Um, early decision is primarily for full pay students when they can pay full, full price to a private school. So that's one of the considerations you need to think about. You can get out of an early decision um, agreement, but it's not comfortable, you know, for, for financial reasons. So you don't want to make that mistake. Okay, we can help with the strategic approach to applications as well. Okay, so um, it is my strong belief that college planning works. Um, there's so much complexity and so much confusion with colleges. Um, and really, if you focus on your child, we focus on your child, it works, okay? So uh, just quickly about our services. Um, we have essay boot camps. We talked about that in the summer. That really helps with essay work. The other thing that's unique about our process is that we have a team approach. And so this is kind of a, an image of our, of our team meetings, if you will. Um, when we have students who are working with this, this team approach really makes a difference because they have multiple perspectives on the whole process. And um, so they, they get a team lead who has college admissions experience. I have folks that are my peers as team leads. Um, and then they get an essay specialist who really slows down the process. So I'm very amped up because I care about results and I care about how admissions you know, works and I'm, you know, I've got the pulse on all these colleges, but students really need to slow down when they're writing, right? It, it, it can't, it sometimes, it's not helpful to hear from me, <laughs> you know, you might not get into that school or you might get, you know, it's good to them, for them to just slow down and really be able to focus on their writing. So our essay specialists are fantastic at that and they have backgrounds in, as writing coaches. Um, so the essay boot camps are helpful and the team approach. Um, also the expertise, all of the people that work with us are um, either have uh, many years of admissions experience or financial aid office experience. Um, we have you know, consultants who worked at UCLA in the law school, um, at USC, at Occidental, um, at, uh, at uh, Caltech, at UPenn, and at Scripps. Um, you can take a look at our about page and just read the bios, have a better sense of wh who we are. Um, the other piece is the time. So you know, many consultants who work with students, they will spend a certain amount of time, right? You buy a certain amount of hours. Um, we have found with our team approach, we're spending upwards of 50 hours with our students because there's so much that happens in this process. Um, you know, like that student Cole that I was talking about, you know, he, he really needed a lot of help with his decision about major. And we needed to meet with him multiple times just about that. 
right? So we can recalibrate and recalibrate as we go because we have all-inclusive plans. Um, and we've set it up that way so because our goal is to help students get into college, but it's also to really help them understand who they are in relation to the colleges so that they can thrive. Um, so most parents and students, one of the things I notice is they don't really know what they need, um, and so we really provide that catch-all process. Um, so we only take up to 30 students per year, and we're really quickly creeping up to that. Um, the reason for that is because we have five teams, and each team doesn't get more than five students, so, um, so that we really can give all of our attention to the students. Um, we do have a free, I think I mentioned earlier, we have a free initial consultation. So after tonight, if you wanna sign up for one, if we haven't met yet, please do that with Kim. Um, I'm happy to sit down with you and talk about your individual child's needs and how we would work with them for free, okay? Um, so finally, um, if you're a parent of an eighth grader or a ninth grader, or a 10th grader, or 11th grader, and you're not gonna be necessarily working on applications this summer, um, we wanted to give you this checklist. And um, right over here on Kim's desk, she has um, extra copies. You wanna look at this college planning checklist because it has things to do ninth, things to do in 10th, as it relates to college, things to do, uh, you can see the list gets a lot longer in 11th and 12th, and use that, take that and use that, and compare, you know, how you're doing in high school, how your child's doing, and make sure that they're on track. Um, we don't see our students as checklists. We're not trying to check boxes. We, when we're working with a student, we're going to tailor make the service to make sure that they're on track. Sometimes we work with athletes. Sometimes we work with artists. Sometimes we work with a highly gifted student with a learning disability. You know, so there's all kinds of different students that have special gifts and skills. Um, so although this is helpful, it's a spine of kind of what you want to follow. We want to under, underscore the importance of individual needs as you go through this process. Um, so this year uh, we had about 90% of our students were accepted to one of their top three choice schools. And those who applied early, um, there was about a, a handful of students who did the early action or early decision option they were accepted to over 85% of their colleges. So they had a lot of good news in December. Um, so those are the, some of the benefits uh, when you work with us. And we want you to have successful outcomes. Any questions? I hope I didn't overwhelm you or intimidate you. <laughs> when you do yes. early decision, and you get in and you're happy. Are all of your other uh, schools notified? Those are you have to those? notify You them. notify them. Yeah. So you don't, you withdraw you don't your find application. out where you would have gotten in had you not been on the decision. Correct. You withdraw your application. Correct. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's what they'll do. <clears throat> but do people do that? <laughs> I mean, what I do you suggest? Do I mean, what do you cool. suggest? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. So that's the, the, the right thing to do, right? Is that you've been accepted to the school, you really have no choice, you're going to that school, right? So why would you, why would you take a spot away from it's another kid who's applying, right? It doesn't happen automatically. Well. <clears throat> Correct, it doesn't happen because you know, not every college knows where, you're, where else you're applying. <clears throat> yeah, and like the UC application is due November 30th, right? So that's an, or kind of an early-ish deadline, even though it's a regular decision, non-binding agreement. Um, so if you apply early decision and then you apply to UC, you have to take those back. And can you explain what ED2 is? I've not heard of that before. Yeah. So ED2 is um, binding also. It's early decision, and that's usually a deadline in January. But didn't you say the regular admission is also in January? Right, so there's two different choices. Some colleges offer two different choices. You can go um, early decision, mm -hmm. two, or you can do regular decision. Yeah. yeah. What will you know when you're accepted into your early decision school? Good question. When do you know when you'll get into your early decision or, or maybe early action? So there's also early action, which is non-binding. Uh, usually if it's for private schools and it's November 1, it's gonna be before December 15th. Right. And uh, if you are accepted into it, uh, how much does it factor your second semester of senior year? Second semester? They're not gonna see your second semester of senior year. 
because all the applications are due either in the first semester, right, or at the beginning of the second semester. So they won't see your second semester grades. So should you just get senioritis and like party and Senior. not, right? No, because sometimes if you do really poorly academically and you're waitlisted, let's say, they're gonna see those grades. And even if you're not waitlisted and you're accepted and you deposit and everything, they're still gonna see those grades. <laughs> so sometimes if you, you know, if students really, really plummet, um, admissions officers can be, admissions offers can be rescinded, right? You have to actually graduate from high school. You have to have a decent transcript. Good question. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a lot of push now, it sounds like, to be well-angled as opposed to well-rounded. Uh -huh. So does that mean that, it sounds like pretty much you can't be undecided, so if you have to pick a particular major, if you end up picking like a humanities major, does every, like let's say, just say sociology, does everything on your quote unquote transcript have to look like a sociology major? You know, like That's a really good question. Yeah, um, you know, when we work with students here, I, I do think it's good to have sort of a theme, some kind of, things have to make sense. So if a student is plotting like Cole, he's plotting along, he's doing, you know, he's working at the museum. Um, he's also doing robotics or he's doing, you know, science experiments that he loves and he's also in cello, you know, he's, all of these things are, he's involved in. Um, if he's, let's say he's applying to um, like a major philosophy or something, something that's unrelated. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit confusing for the admissions officer who's mm -hmm. reading it, right. just a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't be admitted necessarily, but it's, it's nice to kind of keep that in mind. If a college has a strong program in engineering and you want to apply as an engineering major, you should have some evidence that you've done stuff to build up to that, right? A little bit. It doesn't have to be... So it doesn't have to be like the whole... Like every no. summer doing something in that particular no. thing. No. Does it just have to be like maybe one or two courses or, or something like that during a summer that points to? Yeah, and you can also, the student can explain that in the essays. They can talk, talk about like I was really interested in art, you know, for so long, but then I discovered science through my teacher mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I was exploding with excitement for experiments and, you know, I saw how art related to science or, you know. So they can explain that. Okay. Um, That's not any weaker. No, no, no. Okay. But it's just about clarity. You know, and it's about really kind of having a sense of mm, like so some, that it has to make sense mm. for the application. So that's what we really help with is to understand the colleges and what they value and how their the student is applying there. But then, what are all the pieces that will be looked at more carefully as right. it relates to that major and that college? <laughs> but just curious, in line with that, like uh, something like a major like sociology, for example. They don't really even have sociology for high schoolers, so yeah. how do you yeah. even... Yeah, so that probably wouldn't matter too much. So for the humanities, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's more like the yeah. specifics, like math. It's and more stuff. like engineering or yeah. art or mm -hmm. film. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. But or, if you're going to be like a yeah. humanities major, it doesn't really matter what you do. Right? Yeah, Is and some true? colleges like Brown or University of Rochester, they have something called the open curriculum. And so you, you know, they, they don't necessarily want you to decide what you're gonna major in. Right, they want you to, yeah, they want you to explore, and but they do want you to be involved, and they want you to have some sense of a personality and a theme when you're applying. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah, good question. Any others? Yes. Your examples yeah. of children all yeah. were like high achieving, super A++ kids, and do you work we with We work with B? all yeah. kinds of different students. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but we work with all kinds of different students. Um, a student who has, we've, work with students who really had a struggle. The sooner we can get to them, the more we can do, right? Um, especially if they start freshman, sophomore year, we have so much more time, um, especially if they're struggling academically. Because like I said, the transcript is the most important piece. So, um, but, a, but a lot of kids are even, struggle? no, I'm talking no. about okay. lower than that. Okay. Yeah, and C's are not the end of the world, but they're not gonna get you into Harvard, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so it's just all about calibration and, and, and expectations and what um, the student is doing in the classroom and how it relates. It's very hard for high school students to know how it relates because it's not something they've experienced yet. Right? So we give them that context um, and that insight. Yeah. But we take average kids. Average kids do very well as well. Um, all kinds of different students with, with special talents. Um, that are maybe not your typical special talents, right? 
So really, that's the beauty of this work is getting to discover that about students along the way. Um, and sometimes also parents come to us because we're not the parent. <laughs> and you know, because of our expertise, we can really guide them in a way that um, has an impact you know, and, and can help them make smart choices along the way. Are you familiar with this program, Naviance or Naviance? Yeah, Naviance. Um, and I understand, from what I understand, you look, look through and look in your school, your high school, and you can see uh, where the previous graduating classes went to college. Mm -hmm. is, is there not a reverse Naviance where the colleges look and see where the high schools that people are admitting, I would just assume that they're that they must have more sophisticated data than just a reader who knows the school. I mean, they have data at schools. Right. How do they use it? It's probably more. Um, why, you know. why? Do you have any comment on you know if you look at a school um, and, and you think that like some schools have are feet have a strong tradition of getting kids into X Y Z school, mm -hmm. um, but maybe they. You look in Avianza, they don't have any admissions to a different school that you, that, that, that you would like right. to go to. Is that, is that, can you comment on that? Or? Yeah, sure. That means your counselor maybe doesn't have a good relationship or doesn't have any relationship with the college admissions officer. Oh, that's from the counselors, you think? Oh, yeah. The high school counselor, college counselor, yeah. is responsible for having relationships with the colleges because they write letters of recommendation. Right? So if there's no relationship, um, then it can be a little bit questionable, right? So the, the relationships matter. Um, does it mean that if, like, let's say nobody gets into Stanford at LaSalle, right, for 20 years right. <laughs> or 15 years, right? Does it mean that one person won't get into Stanford because of that? No, no that, but it makes you not, wonder what's going on. It makes on. you wonder, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you think it's from the high school counselor, sometimes, college sometimes, counselor office? Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, that it's sometimes. Not yeah. I mean, Stanford, obviously, that's, a, that's an extreme situation. Yeah, that's like 4% or 5% right. admit rate. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's something to pay attention to, but doesn't necessarily mean that the student can't get in because they're attending a certain high school, right? It's really about understanding the colleges, and it's understanding the student and how they fit together, um, right? The college uh, counselor at the high school is very important. So even if you, let's say, work with us and you're working with an outside private counselor, um, we have vast knowledge that sometimes that high school counselor does not have, but that doesn't mean that the student shouldn't be taking advantage of that resource and shouldn't be in, engaging with them in a, in a meaningful way. So what we do is we actually coach our students to talk to them, <laughs> to peek their head in, you know, to fill out those brag sheets that they need to do. Um, and really make the most of what the resource is because they do write the letter of recommendation. Um, so, and what we do, and then what we do is we coach the student. Our, our, our work is so focused on student success and that individual, it, nothing else matters to us. We don't have any heads of schools or you know, um, concerns about any other agenda except for the student. Um, and so what we do is we really talk to the student, we empower the student with the knowledge that they need to be effective with the college admissions offices directly. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, you said about like the mistakes for the summer about test prep. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to spend too much time doing test yeah. prep. Yeah. So would you? So I just was. Is that because it's just really time consuming and there's there's better uses of your time? Yeah. I mean, you studies do? show that you know how many times you take the that you can only improve so much. Right. You take it cold. You try it, and if you're tested on, on um, areas that you've, you're familiar with, then you're, you're only going to improve so much, right? You don't go from like a 19 to a 36 on an ACT. It's just not possible. It's not realistic, right? And so, but if kids get so caught up in the number and achieving more, I, you know, every year our students, um, like our seniors, they just, they get sick over it. And I think it's just misguided. I really do. And I think it's um, something that, you know, colleges do value them. Don't get me wrong. So it matters. And you want to do your best. And I think test prep is necessary. But only to a certain point. Okay, so it's more about the individual, like the student yeah. becoming too wrapped up in the score as opposed to 
the actual I guess the score is still very significant. Oh yeah. So the twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Oh yeah. Okay. For sure. I highly recommend test prep, okay. <laughs> but I just don't think it needs to define you. I just you know. So. Any other questions? I am going to hang around a little bit. I'm going to meet with you guys. Um, but I'm going to hang around a little bit and answer questions if you have other individual questions. And please feel free to talk to Kim if you want to sign up for an initial consultation. It's such a pleasure to meet you all. And good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you.